our times call for pessimism of the intellect but optimism of the will. And in a sense, I apply that to the environment and to society. And I do believe that there is no salvation for the environment without a salvation for our society and particularly for the poorest people in our society. Hello and welcome to The Family of Things, a podcast about life and how we choose to live it. I'm Helen Shaw, and my guest today is a man I used to share a newsroom with many moons ago when we both worked in the Irish Times. It's journalist and author Paddy Woodworth, whose writing weaves threads of culture, politics and the natural sciences. When our paths crossed in the Irish Times in the 1980s, Paddy was perhaps best known for his coverage of Spain and the Basque conflict. But today, he's a lyrical storyteller of nature. His epic work, Our Once and Future Planet, is a call to action to us to pay attention to our world, to restore our environment in this climate change century. Welcome, Paddy. How are you? I think you're in Wicklow today, which is where your lockdown habit has been. How is Wicklow today? Wicklow's mixed today. It's very lovely. It's an incredible time of year with all the hawthorn out. But um, it's it sometimes becomes very dark and cloudy uh, as well. Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful day here in Dublin. And I have to say, uh, the birds are nesting. I know you're a mad bird watcher and have a huge interest. So I have heard that there's been some issues for the blue tits because we had such a cold spell earlier. But I'm delighted to say I have blue tits nested and blackbirds and they're all enjoying some water in the garden at the moment. And can you see the blackbird nest? I can hear it. I can't see the nest, but I can hear it because the chicks are very loud. <laughs> uh, we have we have wrens nesting right above our door, and uh, so it's on a it's it's they're nesting in the house, and wow. well you know in the exterior part of the house, but on a deck, and and so uh, when I'm having my breakfast, uh, the wrens get very upset because they. They come and they perch and they bounce about a yard away from me, but they're kind of usually too nervous to fly up to the nest. So now I take the chair out onto the lawn and then they can come in and out and they don't they don't feel inhibited. How beautiful. That's so lovely. I'm definitely one of these people who became more aware of bird life, of bird song and nature with the pandemic because walking every day, spending more time in my garden and in a sense being grateful for that. And we probably all hope that it's one of the things, one of the good things that will come out of this period of pause. But for you, nature has been a constant. I mean, you grew up with that love from your parents, I think. Yeah, I grew up with it and then I lost it and then I found it again. I I never lost it completely as a love of nature, but birds in particular, I I was fascinated by birds as a child. And we lived in unusual circumstances every summer in that my parents rented out our house in Bray. And we moved to a, what I later discovered was actually a British Army Nissan hut which um, somebody had transferred, I think, from the Tala camp to the Sugarloaf. And uh, we had no running water and no electricity for three months of the year. And uh, it, it was quite a magical life. And at a very early age, I can remember as a very young child, uh, building a zoo and you get a very obliging postman because I used to ask him to bring me a new animal every day like a hippo or a giraffe or, or something like that and I became fascinated by birds my parents were kind of all-rounders but, 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 but hang on a sec where was the postman getting all these animals I have no idea I have no <laughs> idea they were it was all imaginary but he played along with the game ah. which was lovely he just you know he after our, after I asked him once or twice, he, he you know, every day would... I mean, I think I would ask him for the animal and he'd say, yes, here it is, and pass me something which wasn't anything. 
and I had I how, built these I built these little cages on the grass. How magical! How magical! I mean, were your parents very into nature? Tell me a little bit about them. Um, I think they kind of regarded being interested in nature as part of being a human being. You know, they weren't they weren't naturalists. I suppose they kept some records. I'm thinking back to their kind of bird books and plant books. There would have been little notes in them occasionally. I mean, they were very good parents in the sense that I think they, with all of us, encouraged the interests we had and um, um, and were very positive about it. I mean, I think they found me, you know, they probably had to suppress a bit of irritation when I became really obsessed with birds between about 10 and 14 um, and really didn't want to do much else except go out and watch birds. But it wasn't just birds. I loved being out in landscapes and I, I loved being out in landscapes on my own. And so I had this, another thing that, you know, very few children, I guess, could do today was that, you know, I spent long hours on my own on, in, in, on the Sugarloaf. And, um, and I, I, it was kind of a dreamy kind of existence, I guess. I, I read a lot. I don't think I brought books with me on walks. So I was interested in everything I was seeing, but for some reason never developed an interest in plants, um, uh, which my mother did know about. And I think that was a bit of a disappointment to her. Um, but she learned more about birds because I was interested in birds. And your family. So the Woodworths, Protestant, Bray, and in many ways, I suppose, middle class. How would you see your childhood growing up in the 50s? I mean, as I came to see them later, they were a kind of odd mix of class. I mean, my my father was was very much solid Dublin kind of accountancy, uh, Protestant middle class. Uh, my mother came from faded, very very faded landed gentry, and they they kind of needled each other about 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 that you know e- echoes of class. But they were ambitious for us. So I, I was sent to a, a prep school, which I hated many aspects of. And I, I particularly hated its um, very West British ethos, which was not the ethos of my family. Uh, you know, in a sense, they were doing that classic thing that parents try and do. They were, they were trying to better us. They hadn't gone to those sort of schools. Um, and I, I reacted very strongly against the uh, little bit of Britain that this school actually was in the middle of Bray. And, um, and I suppose the summers were all the more important to me for that because they were, they were a total escape from that very regimented prep school life where I was, I was a day boarder. I was there from eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the evening, six days a week. We were not only discouraged, we were suppo- forbidden to have any contact with townspeople uh, during term time in case we would bring disease into school. Um, so even if my parents would have gone to the pictures on a Sunday, uh, uh, we couldn't have. You know, you, 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 you were very, very restricted. So um, I reacted very strongly against that. And I took a hurley onto a hockey pitch at the age of about 12. And uh, I began reading some Republican texts. Um, I remember, well, not very Republican, but I remember reading a, a biography of Michael Collins and having it confiscated. Um, <laughs> and I, I also remember uh, a moment where another boy in the class, um, whose name, oddly enough, his surname happened to be Britain, uh, but he, he drew an Irish tricolor and put it on his pencil box. Um, just had a, you know an idle kind of thing that amused him uh, and one of the teachers came in saw the tricolor picked it up and said i always knew you were a bit of a bolshevik britain but there's no need to fly the red flag in here and i had no idea what a bolshevik was but i immediately thought a bolshevik must be rather a good thing if this teacher <laughs> hated it so much so in many ways that school made me kind of reactively a, a republican and a leftist without having really any any framework for those thoughts at that time. Because, yeah, you mean, you become quite politicised in, in the 70s as a young fella. I mean, obviously, the world's in, in turmoil. You have 1968, 1969, you have Paris, 
you, you've Northern Ireland happening, student politics quite intense. But for you, what was happening? Because you later on join official Sinn Féin. And as you say, that reaction to your grounding in the prep school, that you become much more of, of a Republican. Yes, and I wasn't wildly political at all. It it was very reactive. And it was also about wanting to belong. You know, something told me that these people that I was at school with, not not my fellow pupils, many of whom were were good guys that I had good friendships with, um, but many of our teachers lived in a bubble that that I, I, I kind of knew instinctively wasn't the Ireland I was growing up in. And mm. I was then very fortunate in that my parents couldn't afford to send me to the second stage of that process, which would have been a public school like St. Columbus. Um, and instead, I was sent to uh, what was then a VOCA school in Black Rock, which was a kind of shabby bohemian um, middle class Protestant school, a very different kind of animal, kind of quite liberal in its thinking, quite loose in its discipline. And... Um, and I enjoyed it enormously. I had a very good time there, kind of had a, you know, growing up teenage girls and rock and roll and beginning to look for uh, the psychedelics that were emerging through our records in in uh, in the late 60s and um, in the kind of Dunleary Black Rock area. Um, and I I wasn't very political, really, until I remember John de Courcy, Ireland, uh, who was teaching in another school that merged with ours, and he came to teach us history and geography in my final year. And he was a really inspirational teacher. You know, I suppose everybody says they have one of somebody who's a big influence on them. And this guy comes in and he's, you know, he's been in the Merchant Navy and he, he always walks to school in a sports coat. He was very unconventional in many ways and he had traveled the world he had he'd been a communist uh until i think the mid 50s i think he probably left the communist party over the invasion of hungary um but he always had a socialist homeland so in that period i knew him the countries he idealized would have been tito's yugoslavia and um Boumediene's algeria and he talked about those countries and he'd been to those countries and he knew people there. So he was a fascinating man. But his that year of his teaching us coincided with the explosion of uh, the conflict in Northern Ireland. It coincided with the kind of peak of the anti-Vietnam War protests in the United States. And I began to go on anti-Vietnam protests in Dublin. And uh, I remember a key moment where... Um, we kind of moved from slogans like, you know, Yankees out of Vietnam to saying victory to the Viet Cong. It was a switch. You were no longer just opposing the American presence. You were supporting something else, which was the, the international socialist movement dominated by the Soviet Union. So I, I began to flirt with those ideas. But as the northern conflict developed and I looked at what was happening on the ground and you supported the civil rights movement and then Bloody Sunday happens. And OK, so do you need to go further than support for a kind of pacifist civil rights movement? Do you move towards armed struggle, as we romantically called it? And I was always very un- uncomfortable with the provisionals. Um, to put it mildly, I thought the provisionals were conducting a, a ethically wrong and also very, very dangerous campaign that seemed to me likely to lead to a sectarian civil war. And uh, I was very attracted, and maybe this was the Protestant in me, though I'd, I'd ceased to be a Protestant in any meaningful religious sense from the age of about 15. But I became... Um, attracted towards the officials because the officials doctrine if you like was that we had to unite the people before we united the island and so rather than provoke a sectarian war with the protestant working class we would attempt to build bridges to them now as we all know the officials failed pretty miserably in building those bridges but i think i think it was a an honorable effort 
um, uh, with many bad things along the way that I'm not proud of. But um, I think these were very turbulent, time, turbulent times. And there was that sense also, you know, that you, you have to make a commitment. And I remember a, a key moment for me in a sense of deciding to join a party and a party that at the time had a, had a military wing um, was what happened in Chile. Uh, when uh, the socialist leader um, Salvador Allende was elected in Chile, uh, the Americans backed the military to overthrow him and set up a really vicious military dictatorship. And so it did seem to me that there was no way for a socialist party to come to power in the capitalist world if it didn't have something more than votes behind it. And that's very dangerous thinking, and I... I think I was probably wrong, but at the time it seemed to make sense. It's always interesting to have a conversation with our young self and and in some ways that idealism of a socialist paradise, you might think, comes up again and again, you know, whether, as you say, being on anti-Vietnam marches and actually it going from not just being anti-war but supporting the Viet Cong. And also then much later in my time there was huge romanticism around Nicaragua and so many people went as volunteers and Ortega, Daniel Ortega was at that stage the revolutionary hope for a socialist place, a socialist paradise and now you look at what has become this dictatorship in a sense so you know when we look back at that at those engagements we had politically with ideas it can often be that confrontation or that conflict between ideals and reality yeah and it's very complicated in that you know in the 1980s I became very very disturbed by what I saw as a a remnant of militarism uh, within the officials, uh, which was very secret, but, you know, if you kept your eyes open, it was there. Um, I was also, you know, my eyes were, they should never have been closed, but they were they were much more open to the very negative aspects of life in the so-called socialist countries, and the Soviet Union in particular. And I left the party in the mid-1980s, and I had... I had hopes then that perhaps you could achieve uh, a just, fair society um, through social democracy. And I maintained those beliefs um, up until 2008. Uh, And then 2008 and the banking crisis has really made me think again. There's no movement that I can really identify with at the moment except the environmental movement in the broadest sense. Um, but I am i was so horrified by what happened in 2008 and maybe particularly in 2011 when the Labour Party um, really became, in my view, a kind of vehicle for making the, the vicious austerity. austerity that Fine Gael were imposing. They became the vehicle for... Um, pacifying a, a, a lo- the large section of the Irish working class that they represented uh, and, 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 and somehow supposedly sugaring this pill. And, and really what happened then was absolutely unacceptable. A very small group of people took a huge amount of money from the rest of us and people suffered terribly as a result. And there has been no no resolution of that. No. Suppose we should say for people who are too young to to know that official Sinn Féin becomes later on the Workers' Party, becomes later on Democratic Left. So in some ways, the modern Labour Party has elements of that merging through it as well. But this idea, that conflict between ideals and reality, as you say, when we crossed paths in the Irish Times, uh, when I joined, I I went into the Irish Times 
as a very young one in the mid 80s and then went up to Northern Ireland uh, as a reporter for a few years. But you were covering the Basque conflict and ETA and that's the source of your book, Dirty War, Clean Hands. And Spain became a really big part of your life. And obviously for many people, ETA and, and the Basque independent struggle equally has elements of that romanticism about it. But that was in so many ways a very bloody civil war and in, in still has ramifications in, in modern Spain. But what drew you to Spain and to become so deeply invested in Spain and particularly in the Basque conflict and in covering it? Because it's still a big part of your life, Spain itself. Hugely, hugely. Uh, and it also brought me back to nature, which was curious, um, though it took me a long time to really recognise that. Um, I went there by chance. I'd finished university in 1975. I had absolutely no career ambitions. I was very political, at least in my own head. And I did think there was going to be revolutionary change within the next couple of years. So there was no point in having a career. I had no career ambitions whatsoever. Very unlike a lot of my comrades, actually, who were building very successful careers in RTE at exactly the same time. But while I didn't want a career, uh, I did want, you know, and this was, I suppose, the Protestant coming out in me in some way, uh, I did want to pay my father back uh, for some debts I had from university. And a Spanish guy told me in the summer of 75, it's very easy to make money teaching English in Bilbao. And I thought, oh, Bilbao is the Basque country. Um, Basques, there's an independence movement there that seems to have some parallels with Ireland. It might be an interesting place to go. And I went there and was able to make the money I needed to make very easily. And, uh, and I became fascinated by the whole culture. I always say I learned to eat in the Basque country because uh, I'd never paid much attention to food in Ireland, um, uh, ex- except as a fuel. And in the Basque country, I learned this, this wonderful thing that, you know, it's, it's not a sort of upper class thing to go to a restaurant in the Basque country. It's something that, you know, truck drivers do. And they're very fussy about their food. And um, so... Uh, And I found I was made very welcome there as an Irish person, often for rather spurious reasons. You know, there was this idea, particularly if you were, you know, if you were in a village that was largely Basque nationalist and you were Irish, well, you were made welcome. But they didn't have a clue what was going on in Ireland. And we didn't have really much clue what was going on there. And I began to try and I suppose it was a kind of parallel universe. Here you had, you had a an armed left-wing movement, again, split into two wings. In the Basque case, the millies and the polymillies, the militaries and the political militaries. And the officials were a bit more like the political militaries and the provosts were more like the the millies. And I I suppose it gave me an opportunity, in a way, you could say, to, to live vicariously some of what I'd been living in Ireland. And it gave me a kind of a distance that in analysing what was happening in the Basque country, maybe I could understand what was happening in Ireland better. And I always found the Basque country and Ireland are are fascinating because there are lots of similarities, but every similarity is also a difference. So teasing out those ideas became very fascinating for me. And I, I formed very deep friendships there. And I talked to everyone across the political spectrum. And I finally then became fascinated by this story of the dirty war within the Basque conflict, if you like, when the the Socialist Party, Spanish government, which should have been an exemplary democratic government, began to use death squads against ETA. And it so happened that uh, an ex-flatmate of mine from 1975 had become a very senior member of the Socialist administration and was running these death squads. So I thought, well, if I could write a book about this, it wouldn't just be what the Spanish call a book of denunciation, uh, that it would be more a book of trying to understand what was motivating all these actors to do the terrible things they were doing. And how somebody becomes the leader of a death squad like that. So, yes. And so I, I hoped he would talk to me. He then, you know, he was 
the dirty war in Spain was odd in one respect compared to what the British did in Northern Ireland in that some of the leading political protagonists were actually identified, brought to trial and went to jail. So they always managed to get out very quickly. And he was one of the people who was convicted and went to jail. I'd always hoped he would talk to me, but I mean, he'd stayed in my parents' house in, in 1976. We were we were that close at that time. Um, but we had grown, obviously, completely apart, and uh, he would never talk to me in any meaningful way. To my enormous surprise, one of his senior colleagues in the Socialist Party did and, and gave me a, an interview which I think really did reveal the thinking of the brains behind the death squad. So, I, you know, it's happened so often in writing. You think one thing is going to open a door for you, but you actually find that's not the thing that opens the door for you, but, but there's a door beside them that you haven't noticed and you, you walk through that one instead. And as you say, being in Spain also brought you back to nature and brought you back to that experience of your childhood in the Nissan hut in the Sugarloaf. And and that's where so much of your life and time now is in this idea of restoration and ecological restoration. Your book, Our Once and Future Planet, I mean, that's 2018, so quite some time after your Basque writing. But this marked a completely different juncture in your life. And in a sense, you go from the, that experience of being the lefty in the official Sinn Féin to where you are now, which, as you say, the only politics that you're committing 100% to is that of the environment. But what brought you to write Our Once and Future Planet? Well, it was, in a way, my Basque book, the first Basque book, Dirty War, Clean Hands, um, uh, to my surprise, got a lot of academic respectability. I hadn't written it as an academic book, but it ended up being published by Cork University Press and then by Yale in the States. And so I was invited to the University of Iowa, to the International Writers Programme, on the back of that book. And... um, I I had already begun to develop this idea that I wanted to write a book about nature and culture. I had this idea of following cranes and other migratory birds, not really as a bird watcher, but as a kind of culture watcher. And to see, you know, what do people say about cranes when they arrive in southern Spain uh, at the beginning of winter? And what do people in Sweden say when they arrive in spring? And I, and what myths are associated with them? And um, I thought then you could look at birds that migrate from, you know, eagles that migrate from Africa through the Middle East into Europe. It seemed to me to offer wonderful cultural journeys as well. So I, I, those ideas were swimming around in my head. And I was very lucky. And on that program, the director was a poet and environmentalist called Christopher Merrill. Um, very interesting man. And he brought us out on a weekend of prairie restoration with the great American writer Peter Matheson. And this phrase restoration, sorry, the phrase ecological restoration blew me away because restoration to me was something you did to a car or a painting or a house. Um, But the idea that you could restore a damaged ecosystem seemed absolutely revolutionary to me because I'd, insofar as I thought about it at all, I'd grown up with the model that I I suspect most of us still have, which is that we do two things with nature. We develop it for our own use, as we must, uh, but in so doing, we degrade it and perhaps ultimately destroy it, or we preserve it as if it's something you could put in a jar, and we call the jars national parks, and we build fences around them, and The only people in national parks are scientists and tourists. That's a terribly sterile idea. Nature's over there and we're over here. What I loved about restoration was it was kind of saying we, we live within ecosystems and if we managed ourselves and our lives within those ecosystems better, we could restore them to their full health, their full biodiversity, 
Um, and I began to learn that this also could have impacts and very positive impacts on slowing down climate change. Um, so I became really excited about this idea of restoration and and it gave me an opportunity to find out that yes, in, in Vietnam, I found restoration projects in Australia, in Costa Rica, in Mexico, um, and in Ireland, I found people were restoring bogs. And I, that's extraordinary. And people are restoring woodlands and river systems. And the whole idea of restoration, it appealed to me. I much prefer the, the phrase restoration to rewilding because I think rewilding is very problematic and it alienates a lot of people. And it, it suggests that there is a wild out there that's quite different from us. Whereas restoration is saying we're, we're in a relationship with the ecosystem and in a way to restore ourselves, we need to uh, restore ecosystems. So there's, there's an element of uh, social restoration in this project as well. And, you know, it's, it's excited me ever since and it's been a great privilege to work with ordinary citizens and scientists who are working in this field. What, what's lovely about your book and what you also make a point of saying from the beginning is that so much of, of what we talk about in climate change or in the environment is about despair and pessimism and this timeline to destruction and that when it's reported, it's always seen as these inevitable er erosions that are happening and that the human, the one individual can feel helpless or ineffectual in, in an ability to change. But then in looking at restoration, it also, as you say, restores our ability as, as people. And it's almost where we started when we talk about the pandemic, that the pandemic, if there was one grace to it, that it opened up people to walk in their 2K, their 5K, to pay attention, to really focus on how they were living in their local environment and to also have much more of a commitment to what was happening around them. So you do use this line from T.S. Eliot, and I was a huge T.S. Eliot fan uh, in my English lit degree, but, you know, that that we shall not cease from exploring. And at the end of it, our exploring, we will arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And that idea of looking at something and seeing it anew is very much part of what you're describing in Restoration, that it is one where we move from denial and despair to hope and action, to actually being participatory in the change in our own environment. Yeah, I think that's critical. My original title for my book or original subtitle would have actually been a good news story from the environmental movement, because I think that, you know, despair disables us. And there are good reasons to be very, very worried and very anxious at the moment, for sure. But that doesn't help us advance. And I think that restoration, also by the fact that you can restore with the simplest acts and very, very complex acts. So, you know, if you, instead of planting an exotic rhododendron in your garden, you plant a native willow tree, for example, um, that willow tree will support native species in a way that the rhododendron mainly won't. So you're actually kicking in to that cycle of restoration with a very small act. At the same time, you know, scientifically informed projects are actually restoring very large landscapes surprisingly quickly and surprisingly effectively because nature is very resilient. And, you know, while it does require management, you manage as little as possible. You let nature do as much of the heavy lifting as the damaged system can still do and you're you're essentially enabling the system to come back to a point where it can do all that heavy lifting itself. I mean, do you have a sense of optimism, Paddy, about the pandemic being a time for awakening for human beings? Because we have had this intense period of quiet skies and of pausing from what often seems this hectic pace and schedule that, that we put ourselves on. I mean, there's two ways of looking at it that historically and, and in fact, everything I've ever studied is history. And history might tell us that we'll bounce back and actually we'll bury all the, these sense of the pandemic, a goodwill to nature in our rush to actually 
fuel the the global economy on again. But there is that sense that because it's been sustained and there's been such a conversation about it, that many human beings and many of us will take away some aspects of self-awareness and self-knowledge from this period of the long pause. How do you see it? I mean, has the pandemic accelerated the conversation about restoration? Has it brought more public engagement to it? Or would you be more of the mindset that once, you know, we can get busy again, we'll just get busy? Um, I was more hopeful during the first lockdown where it seemed to me a real change was happening. Um, um, then I think things began to become very ragged. And I also think if we look at things globally, um, responses to the pandemic have been so irrational. So if you look at the response of the Trump administration, the first responses of the Boris Johnson, Bolsonaro in Brazil, more recently Modi in India. And it's very hard to be optimistic about our future on this planet when you see large numbers of people following such, to me, obviously irrational leaders. I still, despite this... um, lip service that's paid to words like sustainability uh, by the government today and um, uh, and by opposition parties. I, I don't think that very many of them, I sometimes wonder if even the Green Party has actually really understood the magnitude of change that is required, not only a change in how we live, but a change in our attitudes. I, I think... Um, In our values. In our values. I mean, surely at the moment, the Greens are part of a Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael coalition, and in some ways in a similar position to where you saw Labour during the post-banking crisis coalition and the austerity programme. Yeah, and of course, I think the Greens bear a heavy responsibility for their collaboration with Fianna Fáil in in the first phase of the post-banking crisis. Um, uh, This time around, I mean, I think you have to give them credit for the climate bill is a a very significant achievement. Uh, I'm not sure that they grasp the importance of the biodiversity emergency to anything like the same extent or the importance of restoration. I think they're beginning to. Um, I think a lot is still to play for. We need to see if uh, the National Parks and Wildlife Service and that whole area of managing biodiversity in the country is going to be done properly because it has been done in the most extraordinarily haphazard is the most complimentary term I could come up with. It's under-resourced for sure, but the problem isn't just under-resourcing. The problem is really bad structures. The problem is national parks, which are not directed by scientific programs and are are falling apart as a result. Um, Now, there is a review of the National Parks and Wildlife Service underway. The review is being done by people who are very well informed uh, and I think will do a very good job. But I think there will be big efforts to bury this review. So I think it's too early to judge the Green Party in this government yet, for sure. But I go back again to kind of uh, a slogan that I think was, it's used by a number of people, but I think uh, the Italian Marxist Gramsci used it, which is said, said that in the 1930s under fascism, our times call for pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will. And in a sense, I apply that to the environment and to society, because when I say that the environmental movement is the only one I identify with, those are the kind of obvious goals I work for every day. But I also work a little with, you know, refugees and asylum seekers, those kind of issues. And I do believe that there is no salvation for the environment without a salvation for our society and particularly for the poorest people in our society. Your social conscience and that sense of your politics from the 70s and 80s 
really connects with 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 how you're using the environment and this story of restoration with, say, asylum seekers. You've created with the Syrian Muhammad Ashur these sanctuary walks. What's the sanctuary walks? Like everybody else, um, I was very upset by what I saw happening uh, five, six, seven years ago in the Mediterranean and continues happening to this day of, you know, little children being washed up, drowned on beaches. Um, this was Europe. This was the, this wealthy, social democratic European Union. And on the edge of our world, there are millions and millions of distressed people and people fleeing wars, etc., etc. So I wanted to do something about it. No idea what I could do. Um, and I, I joined um, an organization called Dublin City of Sanctuary. And people were talking about sanctuary in universities, sanctuary in faith groups, etc., etc. All very good ideas, and they were doing some wonderful stuff. And I suddenly thought, why not sanctuary in nature? You know, mightn't there be people in direct provision uh, who might enjoy going out for a walk in nature? And from the beginning, I had the idea that it's an exchange. It's not a gift. We invite people to come out on walks with us, and we show them you know, Irish plants, Irish birds, Irish animals, Irish landscapes. And we ask them about, you know, the birds and animals, plants that they may be familiar with. So um, I started it in a very ad hoc way. Uh, sometimes just two or three people came out and it began to build. And then Mohammed uh, arrived one day. I think I'd met him at a meeting in Dublin and he came out on one of the trips and he began to come more and more and he began to bring more Syrian friends with him. And uh, and one day he said to me, he said, you know, Paddy, people really like what we're doing and the numbers were getting bigger. But he said people would like to see the built heritage. He happens to be an architect. Uh, they, they would like to see the built heritage, the cultural heritage of Ireland, as well as the natural heritage. So we talked about it a bit and he helped me organize a trip to Castletown House. So we, we went to see the architecture of Castletown House and the lifestyle and all the rest of it. But we also went to the gardens and the grounds and the River Liffey nearby. Um, and so we began to think of, you know, could we actually call this sanctuary in nature and heritage? And... Um, at this point, I realized that Muhammad was actually the mainstay of the whole operation. And so I asked him to become my partner. And we're just actually, again, as we're speaking, I sent out an email about the first of our post-pandemic trips. Because obviously, in the, and it's going to be very difficult because a lot of the things that we could do before, we were, we were encouraging people to mix, to eat together to break out of their family groups and meet people from other to meet cultures, etc. It's going to be much harder to do that because for yeah, the moment, yeah. people are going to have to remain in their family or personal bubbles and socially distanced from other ones. But we're doing one to Christchurch Cathedral as part of Refugee Week. Mohammed again has organized a visionary little exhibition uh, called Homing Pigeons, which are bird illustrations that children in Aleppo still living in Aleppo, which is his home city, uh, have sent to Dublin. And we'll go to the Wildflower Garden in, in St. Audouin's nearby. And then somebody from Birdwatch Ireland who've become involved in helping us as well with the, the nature walk this time. Brilliant. Paddy, I know that you split your life before the pandemic between Dublin and in Stony Batter and Wicklow in your beautiful hideaway in nature um you're long married to trish who of course has a very high profile life with disney but what's your remaining wish list for somebody who's traveled so much and who's now made the environment or ecological restoration your mission well, it's, it's a painful question in some ways because I've been trying through the pandemic and, and largely failing, though I think I'm beginning to get there. I have this idea. I turned 70 very recently. Congratulations. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's I don't know. 
it's uh, <laughs> doesn't always feel like something you want to be congratulated for. But the but alternative it's much is better, much worse. Much the better than the alternative. Is much worse. Um, but um, I I do believe that I would like if I you know if I if I survive another ten years, I would like them to be much more reflective years, much slower years. I want to do less but do it better. I'm increasingly loathe the speed. Uh, of social media. Uh, I want more and more and more to spend days reading a single book and not listening to the news. I've almost stopped listening to the news in this latter phase of the pandemic, actually, because I was getting so angry with the successive incompetent acts of governments. Um, and um, I, I want to focus more. I want to spend more time with the people I love. And but continue making new friends and you know sanctuary and nature and heritage is a wonderful way to do that um i will still travel a bit but i'll think a lot more carefully about travel in future and one of my most striking moments in in the last few days was i, I use a hand lens which is like a baby microscope mm -hmm. to look at flowers or insects in more detail and I, I i've started studying grasses and you know we walk on on grass all the time if we're lucky um we don't notice it very much if you look at sweet vernal grass which is just the earliest one to come into flower and it's in flower at the moment and if you look at it through a hand lens it is like visiting a cathedral there is this thing which appears to be completely insignificant grubby little plant and you look at it in detail and it's kind of you know psychedelic memories come into play i suppose but you see the infinity in in the very small and you realize that there are you know incredibly beautiful quite erotic shapes these are the sexual parts of a plant after all but they're all displayed in this extraordinary way that no designer could emulate. And so I want to have more moments, moments like that, moments of kind of stillness um, and moments of focus. Um, but I want to have fun again. I, I do look forward to having a few pints and listening to traditional music. <laughs> I know that you connect with the title of our podcast, The Family of Things. And as you're talking there, it reminds me how Mary Oliver goes in that poem where she says, meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely the world offers itself to your imagination and calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. Because that sounds a little bit what you're talking about, is that in the end, that's where we are rounded journey comes through is to recognize that that's what we're part of well it's it's very strange you should say that because i um i don't know if i told you this but i through the first six to seven months of the pandemic i read mary oliver every day i think i've read most of her poems several times over some of them many many times over and uh, yeah I think essentially you know an awful lot of what her poetry does is capturing that the kind of intense focus uh, which is incredibly liberating because it, it reminds you of where you really are in the world rather than where your brain is thinking you are rather than where you're going or where you come from but where you are right now Paddy, it's been lovely to catch up with you and hopefully we'll meet in human form on a walk in nature in the Phoenix Park or somewhere like that again. But good luck with everything you're doing and hope to read and hear from you again soon. Thanks for joining us here on The Family of Things. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's been, I feel like I've been psychoanalyzing myself with your questions. So thank you very much. <laughs> Not at all. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Paddy. Thank you.